So our scripture lesson for tonight, there's actually two of them. I'm going to read, the first is from the Gospel of Luke, the familiar story of the Nativity, uh, the birth of Jesus. And I'm going to read from the Gospel of Luke, the second chapter, verses 1 through 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus declared that everyone throughout the empire should be enrolled in the tax lists. The first enrollment occurred when Quirinius governed Syria. And so everyone went to their own cities to be enrolled. Since Joseph belonged to David's house and family line, he went up from the city of Nazareth in Galilee to David's city called Bethlehem in Judea. He went to be enrolled together with Mary, who was promised to him in marriage and who was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for Mary to have her baby. And so she gave birth to her firstborn child, a son, and wrapped him snugly and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the guest room. Nearby, shepherds were living in the fields, guarding their sheep at night. And the Lord's angel stood before them, and the Lord's glory shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. Look, I bring good news to you, wonderful, joyous news for all people. Your Savior is born today in David's city. He is Christ the Lord. And this is a sign for you. You will find a newborn baby wrapped snugly and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great assembly of the heavenly forces was with the angel praising God. And they said, Glory to God in heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. And when the angels returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go right now to Bethlehem and see what's happened. Let's confirm what the Lord has revealed to us. And so they went quickly and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw this, they reported what they had been told about this child. And everyone who heard it was amazed at what the shepherds told them. Mary committed these things to memory and considered them carefully. And the shepherds returned home, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. And everything happened just as they had been told. And the second reading for tonight comes from a book that's, that's back in the back of the New Testament, the book of Titus. And I'm going to read from chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. This, like the Luke passage, is one of the traditional readings of Christmas. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. It educates us so that we can live sensible, ethical, and godly lives right now by rejecting ungodly lives and the desires of this world. At the same time, we wait for the blessed hope and the glorious appearance of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave Himself for us in order to rescue us from every kind of lawless behavior and cleanse a special people for Himself who are eager to do good actions. Friends, these are the words of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? God, we have heard the story so many times before. And yet, as we hear it again tonight, may it speak something to us in a new way. May it wake us up to something in our lives right now where you are being born and where you are coming anew. And God, as I begin this message tonight, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, and may there be less of me and more of you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Tonight, I want to offer a brief word of hope. And you can put the emphasis on whatever part of that sentence you want, on the brief part or on the hope part. And maybe there's hope in it being brief. I learned a new word recently. I'm somebody that likes to learn words, and I'm always curious by them. And this is one that that I came upon not long ago, and it was the word sonder. S-O-N-D-E-R. Now, if you've never heard of it before, there's a good reason you haven't heard of it before. Because it's a made-up word. I looked in all these dictionaries, it's not there. My computer reminded me it's not there by putting that ugly red line underneath it every time I typed it out. You know the one I'm talking about? 
the one that says, you have misspelled something, and I have no idea what you're trying to say here. Sonder, it's an invented word. It actually comes from a writer by the name of James Koenig, and I found it in, in a weird source, the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. But still, it's a word that captured me. And it's a word that means this. The realization that each random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex as your own. Populated with their own ambitions, friends, routines, worries, and I like this last part, an inherited craziness. In essence, it means that every single person has a story. That person that's in front of you in line at Publix, they have a story. That person that you see holding the sign out here at the intersection, they have a story. That person at work that drives you up the wall, there's a story there. Each random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex as my own. The word Saunder, it's inspired in part by Stephen Covey. You may know the name. He's the guy who wrote the, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he had this encounter that he often talked about one day on the subway as he was riding home. And as they were going along, he noticed not far from where he was sitting, there was a father with two children. And the children were acting a bit unruly in the subway that day. And he had had a bad day. He was grouchy. And and when he had finally had enough, he stood up and went to the father and said, Would you please get your children under control? And he said the man kind of came to from this dazed appearance and said, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. He said, You see, we've just come from the hospital where their mother is. And the news was not good. And I guess that's just how they're dealing with it. Every passerby is living a life as complex, unique, and vivid as my own. Every person has a unique story. In the spiritual life, we might say it like this. Every single person has a God story. And when we take time to learn it and to see it, then the things in life that are the most ordinary, they all of a sudden become holy. How many people passed by Mary and Joseph on the way to Bethlehem and never gave them a second look, never knew that they carried with them the salvation of the world? How many were too involved with themselves? How many were just too busy with life? How often at Christmas do we go hurrying past the manger on our way to parties, to family gatherings, to presents and preparations? How often do we pass by one another completely unaware of each other's God's stories? How often do we go about our daily routine of life asleep to what our own God's story is. How often do we miss the holiness that hides in the ordinary stuff of our lives? You know, one of the things I love most about the Christmas story, the greatest story perhaps of all time, of God coming into the world to bring redemption and forgiveness and healing and salvation and all these words that you can put on top of it, But how that holiness is hidden. It's embedded in the most ordinary of people and places. How it came in the most non-glorious, bland, ordinary way. A young, unmarried woman who found herself in a very embarrassing situation. Shepherds who did what everyone else in the world called dirty and menial work. Bethlehem. A town that in its day was seen as, at best, insignificant and inconsequential. A stable that was the lowest rent motel room in the town. And yet that is how God's hope comes into the world. May we saunder 
at the stable for just a moment. Because you see, when we do this, we realize that it's a promise for us. That in our ordinary, menial, insignificant, dirty, embarrassing, crazy lives, God is present. And there. And it often comes in ways that we so easily miss. The small act of kindness when our world is falling apart. Or the friendliness of a stranger. Or compassion towards somebody who is in need. A conversation with somebody who truly listens to you. I mean, doesn't just appease you, but truly listens to you. An unexpected smile or an encouraging word or a simple prayer or blessing. It comes in things as simple as a conversation that I had just two nights ago. One of the things we do here at Christ Church this time of year is we go Christmas caroling. Uh, here in the neighborhood and in the community, there's a group that goes around to the, some of the homes around here, and then there's a group that goes out to commercial and federal, and we sing Christmas carols to the cars as they're flying by. But as we're walking out there on Saturday night, one of the gentlemen who, was, who had come with us said to me, as we're walking out there, he said, you know, just last year, I was one of those people that was passing by, and I saw you guys over there singing Christmas carols. Now, this year, I'm here with you. Now, God shows up in the most ordinary places, in the small, ordinary ways. God shows up to remind us, to remind us that the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Or as Titus says in the passage I read just a moment ago, the peace of God has appeared, bringing salvation and healing to all people. The holy is found in the ordinary. And when we saunter, we catch a glimpse of it. A few Fridays ago, I had an opportunity that I was thrilled about. Uh, I had the chance to go and lead um, chapel for Christ Church School. They do it every Friday. Pastor Monique leads it, does an amazing job with the kids. Uh, she was out of town on the St. Augustine trip, so she asked if I would go over and lead chapel for the kids that morning. And, and I decided since it was close to Christmas, what I would do is, is, is talk about some of the symbols there in the sanctuary, some of the things they were seeing. The big tree, the Chrismon tree, if you haven't seen it, I go over after the service is over tonight and And check it out. It's a big, beautiful tree with very specific decorations on it. It's not like our trees at home. Uh, Every one of the decorations is white or gold, and every one of them is a symbol of faith, a symbol of the church in some way, shape, or form. And so as I talked about all the different symbols in the church, we looked at some of the ornaments, and I said, you know, this one means this, or this one means this one means this. I said, the thing is, these are just very special ornaments, symbolic ornaments. Well, as soon as we were done... One of the little girls who was there comes up to me and she says, Pastor Brett, I have a question. Why is there a snowflake on that tree? And of course I gave her a funny look and realized what she was pointing to was this ornament right here. And my first thought when she did it was, ah, she missed the point. She sees a snowflake. I said, no, no, it's not a snowflake. You know, there's the cross in the middle. And then the X is, is the uh, uh, letter chi in Greek, the first, the first letter of the Greek word for Christ. And the more I thought about it, though, I realized something pretty powerful. I realized she didn't miss the point at all. In fact, of the two of us standing there, she seemed to be the only one that got it. She was actually preaching a very powerful Christmas sermon to me. She was preaching that the promise of Bethlehem and the promise of the birth of Jesus was that the holy and the ordinary are so mixed together that it's often hard to distinguish them. The deepest truth is that the greatest words and expressions of God's hope in our lives can be hidden in things as ordinary as snowflakes and shepherds and insignificant villages and towns and places, and innkeepers that are at their wit's end, and low-wage workers, and wealthy and influential people, and cars that go passing by, and family and friends and strangers on the street. And a little girl 
helping her pastor see the beauty, the power, and the hope of Christmas. I think that's our word of hope tonight. Whatever this Christmas Eve looks like for you, whether it's filled with joy and celebration, whether this is a time of sadness and grief, or loneliness and uncertainty, look for God's hope in the ordinary things of your life because God's salvation and redemption and healing of the world will be found there. And don't forget to sonder in the ordinary characters of the Christmas story and what God was doing in them and through them. And don't forget to sonder when it comes to other people. Think about this, the person who's sitting in front of you tonight or the person who's sitting behind you to your left, to your right, the person who parked next to you when you got here tonight. There is a God story in their life. And don't forget that there's a God story in your life too. And be curious enough to discover it. You see, that's really the best gift of Christmas. And that's a hope that goes beyond a single night or even beyond a season. That is a hope that gives us life. When we can find the holy in the ordinary parts of our lives. You know, you usually don't have to look too far to find it. I heard it just before coming up here as we were singing together away in a manger. And of course, the band was singing it beautifully. And I heard just behind me the voices of children singing it. Holy. Holy. Merry Christmas, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.